Welcome to Losing a Child, Always Andy's Mom. On this podcast, we journey through the devastating experience of the death of a child. Grief is seldom discussed openly in our culture, and the death of a child makes people feel even more uncomfortable. We approach the topic openly and honestly, speaking to people who have lost loved ones and experts who help care for them. Whether you are a parent experiencing loss or someone who wants to support another going through this tragedy, this podcast strives to offer hope and help. Welcome to episode 135 of Losing a Child, Always Andy's Mom. I'm Marcy Larson, Andy's mom. You can certainly tell if you listen that I really feel a special kinship with today's guest, Monica. So Monica lost her daughter, Zoe, just seven months ago. So she is so fresh and early in her grief. So what makes me feel this kinship with Monica, though, is the fact that we're both physician moms who lost our kids. It does add a little extra bit of complication that she and I will really talk about and delve into. But it's also interesting how it has impacted us each as doctors afterward. She talks a little bit after we stop recording about how the relationships with her patients have now changed. And that having them see her and a little bit more of her humanity has actually helped those relationships get better and helped her be a better physician to them, they will open up to her now about things that they didn't used to open up to her about. And so overall, as horrible and awful and terrible as this is, she is able to be a more caring doctor to them. Right now, though, for the next hour, I just want you to listen to hear all about Zoe, the wonderful spunky kid that she was, and about Monica's journey in grief after her death. Thank you so much, Monica, for agreeing to come on the Always Andy's Mom podcast and share your Zoe with us. Thank you so much for having me. So I just want to start out by introducing Monica to all of you because Monica wrote to me a few weeks ago and she was fresh, fresh still in grief. And you are still quite fresh in your grief. But she wrote to me particularly because we are both physician bereaved moms. Now that is a very (laughs) particular group of people, right? And believe it or not, there is a bereaved physician mom's Facebook page that I think we're both on. Are you on that Facebook page too? I am. Yes. And it's so funny because you would think that, wow, that's got to be a small group, but it's actually a pretty big group, sad to say. But Mm -hmm. that's, yeah, that's how some of us can sort of get to know each other a little bit through that. So we have that kind of unique in common. And we'll go into that a little bit later, because I think it does give a little bit of a different perspective than maybe some other moms might have. But for now, I really want you to talk about your sweet Zoe. She's such a little cutie. Well, so Zoe was born on August 4th, 2016, and we desi- we decided to add on her middle name, Aria. I don't know if you've ever seen Game of Thrones, uh-huh. but sure. Aria was the, she was the, the biggest one in the, in the whole compilation. She was fierce. Uh-huh. Yeah. She was strong. She didn't let anyone get their way. She would always get her way. And she had a way of getting getting through it. It's kind of small and mighty too, wasn't she? She's like this little thing, but wow, mighty. Mm -hmm. You would never think at the end that she would have been the one to tie all the pieces together, but she, she was, and that's, and I, we did such a great job by using Aria as Zoe's middle as Zoe's middle name because that's just exactly what she was she was small she was fierce she was hard-headed she was funny 
She was cute. She she was baby cute. My older yeah. daughter was pretty, but Zoe was cute. <laughs> Zoe had the chunky cheeks. She had the three rolls on her thighs. She was beautiful as well. Mm -hmm. But whatever mommy or daddy told Zoe not to do, Zoe made it a point to go and do it. Oh, she made it a point. She, <laughs> as as a physician, I'm an endocrinologist, right? So I'm always trying mm -hmm. to like, be careful with the sugar, be careful with the sugar. I'm a type one diabetic, actually, since I was seven years old. Oh, wow. And so, <laughs> so we love sugar. So <laughs> I'll never forget a few weeks before she had passed, I was taking her to get her nails done in preparation for her birthday. And she said, mommy, I'm hungry. And I said, okay, baby, what would you like to eat? She said, I want sugar. <laughs> she didn't even say cookies or I want some corn or some. No, she just got straight down to sugar. <laughs> So <laughs> let's just be real here, mom. I just want sugar. Any form, <laughs> cake, cookies, ice cream, doesn't matter. Candy. We got it all. No big deal. Let's just go sugar. <laughs> <laughs> let's get straight to the point, mom. I'm not going to beat around the bush. And I love that about her. Yeah. I'll never, she must have been about three years old when my husband had told her that she, he was basically punishing her. And he said, you cannot play on your tablet. And she said, tablet? He said, yeah, that square thing. And she said, but daddy, this isn't a square. This is a rectangle. <laughs> and I thought to myself, oh, my goodness. Is, wow. <laughs> that was just brilliant. <laughs> yeah, she's three. We are in for it. <laughs> well, it's just the, the smarts of her to just say, well, daddy, I, I, I guess I can play on this because this is a rectangle. It's not a square. <laughs> right. <laughs> Call it what it is. So Zoe was very courageous. She, she didn't have many fears of anything. Mm -hmm. We actually took, uh, here's a funny story. In 2020, just before the country pretty much closed down in March, COVID, we had already planned a trip from the, from the previous year. We had planned all year long to go to ice. And my best friend, she's a medical examiner. She had actually gone several years prior and she said she loved it so much that she was considering moving over there. But the only reason why she decided not to was because they're really, they, Iceland is a very safe country, very beautiful country, but it really doesn't have a high crime rate. So she said there's probably only three to four deaths per year and it's mostly tourists falling off the cliffs. So they're, they're not a high demand for a medical examiner. Not at all. <laughs> right. <laughs> so when she told me that and knowing how courageous Zoe was, and Zoe's told me before she wants to fly. Little did I know that she would be flying in her afterlife. But mm -hmm. that was the old, that was the first and the only time that I ever considered getting her one of those child leashes. <laughs> right. <laughs> It was a beautiful butterfly, so she thought it was a nice little costume. But I remember oh, nice. in the scrap, I remember in the scrapbook, I wrote, assuming that she would be alive many years later to show the scrapbook to her children. I wrote, I know Zoe, please don't be mad at mommy, but I had to do it so you wouldn't try to fly off the cliff. Yeah. <laughs> so she, Aww. she loved life and everything that life had to to bring to her. So did you make it to Iceland then? We did make it to Iceland. We had just gotten there. My boss called me the night before and said, Monica, are you sure you want to go? I said, oh, we've been saving for a long time. We've been mm -hmm. planning. We went, but coming back, it was it was pretty eerie in those airports. Yeah. yeah we had a that. ton of masks, a ton of <laughs> alcohol, a ton of hand sanitizer. We were supposed to go to Greece for spring break in April, but we didn't because, you know, everything all kind of happened in March. And so we just didn't. Everything was canceled. So, oh, yeah. my goodness. I know. It was supposed to, it was our first like big spring break trip we ever had planned. Yeah. yeah. We haven't done anything. Last year we went to Tennessee. This year we're going to Arkansas. 
But I'm glad you got your Iceland trip in. You must have just snuck it in under the wire. And I'm so thankful for it because it was, it was, it's kind of scary flying with us. And Zoe had never flown before. Uh huh. So my older daughter, Angelina, she had, and she loved it, but Zoe never had. And so Zoe was very rambunctious and she would go and run off in the middle of a crowd and get lost and not care where mommy and daddy were. (laughs) She was just that, that kind of person. And then add on a bunch of, you know, regulations because of a pandemic and it was Mm. a little nerve wracking. Oh, I'm sure. Looking back, I said to myself, I'm so glad that I had those beautiful memories with her. It was amazing. Yeah. I think back to, I mean, how you must look back at that trip and think of how, what a blessing that was. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm starting to get to that stage where I'm looking at her older pictures Mm-hmm. I still can't do videos. Videos still, they tear me up and they just, that's my kryptonite. I just fall when I see videos because it's her alive, you know, yeah. and her voice. She had a very raspy, particular kind of voice. A, a lot of people would at, would have asked about it, but mm-hmm. that was Zoe. <laughs> she was just, she was different. She was cute. She, it's funny actually, because. I'll never forget a conversation my husband and I were having probably a year or two before she passed. And we said, Zoe's going to be a handful when she grows up. And we were worrying more about, you know, just the uh, being more of a rebellious type. Uh And after she passed, we both remembered that conversation. We looked at each other and we said, wow, we knew that we were going to have a hard time with her, but we didn't know it was going to be this hard. Right. So we look back on some of those things and I don't know if I'm the only one that that goes through it, but you kind of look back and see, is this something that maybe I sensed or something that perhaps they sensed Mm -hmm. that could have been coming? I probably like, like two or three weeks before Zoe passed, I just remember telling her one time I was reprimanding her because she said, I don't love you, mom. I don't love you. I had just finished spanking her for something, something rambunctious that she probably shouldn't have been doing. Mm -hmm. And so I was telling her, you should love thy mother and thy father. You know, trying to, just parenting, right? Yeah, yeah. And trying to calm my, my, trying to get my mom chill in. And I said to myself, okay, now you can't let your four-year-old, you know, she doesn't mean it. Mm -hmm. I, I, I remember her saying, as I said to her one day, you know, I may not be here and you need to make the right decisions. And she just looked at me and said, mommy, we're all going to die someday. Really? She's, she was four, Marcy. What business does a four-year-old have saying something that sounds like it would be coming from a 40-year-old, a 30-year-old? Yeah. Not four. <laughs> yeah. That is like some of those little insights that you wonder. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep, they now. Yeah, you were talking also about how she was just learning to draw. So can you talk about that a little bit? Because you sent me this really cute picture of her with a magna doodle. She used to love to draw anything that she could possibly try. One of the first things she started trying to do was making traces of her hand. Uh Uh-huh. So when you look in my office, my whole office is surrounded by pictures from from both of my girls, from Angelina and Zoe. Uh And with Zoe, she she loved making the the round faces and Uh then a round body and then the sticks for the arms and legs. Sure. So I have these graduated photos from when she was like two and then three and then Uh four when the Uh circles were getting a little bit smaller Uh and the eyes started getting eyelashes. Uh Um, Do you have one where the arms and legs coming straight from the head? (laughs) I bet I do. I bet you do. Because that's a developmental stage that they go through. Oh so, my goodness. Uh-huh. Yeah. The where the arms and legs can come straight from the head. It's it's very and because parents are always very alarmed by that. I'm like, oh no, that's totally normal. 
because I, you know, I study like child development and you can see, I can, I can usually tell how old a kid is based on what picture you show me. So you can oh. kind of pick out their age because they just developmentally just change us how they look at things. I love yes. that. I love it. It's just such a fun, obviously, you know, you can see I love pediatrics. I just love being around kids and as they grow up. So, and she just sounds like such a little spitfire and, and I just love it. That she definitely was. <laughs> That's yeah. probably the best way to describe her. My husband used to call her wrecking ball. <laughs> she would just go and run into everything, break whatever she could of her sisters, tear, tear the Legos apart. Yeah. So I, I think that you had told me that she actually passed away on her birthday. Is that right? She did. Yeah. So why don't you talk about that birthday first? Because I think I would want to hear about kind of the more pleasant stuff first for the birthday because she was turned five. She did turn five. So the, the weekend before her birthday, we had gone to my parents' house and the, the whole mm-hmm. family came. And so that was her last birthday cake that we got to, that we got to cut for her and everybody brought their presents. But we said when she turns five, which she was about to turn five, we were going to take her on a big Disney trip. Okay. She was, she already met the height requirements to get on Space Mountain and a lot of the, the, the other rides and whatnot. So we said, okay, she's ready. She loved yeah. roller coasters. She, she was fine. Mm-hmm. And um, so um, unfortunately she never made it into Disney world. Yeah. We, we had actually, it was August 3rd and I had gotten off of work. And my husband said, she's, she's got a fever. Mm-hmm. Sure. You thought, oh, that's a bummer. She's got a fever. It's her birthday. You know, that's yes. too bad. Right. Kind of wrecking her birthday with a fever. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. It was a little worrisome for me though, because she had had a fever about three weeks prior. Okay. And her fevers always made me nervous because she, they seemed kind of like the absence seizures. They weren't really convulsive seizures where my, my other daughter had, or, or I had, she would just stare off into space. With, with fevers, right? Like febrile seizures. Yes. The, with yes. it, they only occurred with, with fevers. Mm-hmm. Which we see that. So, you know, people might not know about that, but this is not an uncommon thing for kids who get high fevers to get a seizure. And oftentimes it's usually when the temps are going up or when the temps are dropping. So it's when those, when you're having those extremes, when it's going up really fast or down really fast, you can end up having a seizure. Um, And it's very scary in general for parents. But once you have one, you are a little more prone to do that again. And so, and it sounds like it's in your family and right. Yeah. Usually it's something that you end up growing out of. It just happens like in childhood. Mm -hmm. Right. So seeing that I had grown out of mine, my oldest daughter had grown out of hers. Every time Zoe had one, I would just hold her and, and my husband would watch just to make sure that she wasn't at any risk for, for choking on anything for aspirating. Um, so we had we had treated her with the Motrin and she mm-hmm. was hungry. She was very hungry. I remember when I got home from work on August 3rd and she had a couple of granola bars and and some chicken nuggets from McDonald's. Those were one of her favorites. She was just really hungry. So I figured, OK, maybe she's ch- she's uh, trying to fight the bug or whatnot. But mm-hmm. I get more worried when they're sick and they're not eating or drinking. Sure. <laughs> Sure. Absolutely. So seeing her eating and drinking, I said, okay, we've got this. So we're, we're not too far off from Orlando. Actually, we're probably about two, two and a half hours away. So we decided to drive up that night and then the festivities would start on her actual birthday, August 4th, the next day was well, we, as we're getting to the Disney resort and 
we're checking in, we're just kind of scoping around and she comes with me to the bathroom. And so she's using the bathroom. We're all happy. We're all happy because she's learning how to use the restroom on her own and she's no longer in any any pull-ups or anything. So I give her a high five, Sally. I remember I was very happy with her. And then as we're walking out, my husband and my older daughter are waiting outside for us. Zoe just walks right past him. Like she just, she looks kind of like a zombie. And she had done that before on one of her febrile seizures. So um, I just kept my eye on her and I noticed she was going to like a safe haven. She was going to an area where there was a, a chair up against a wall. So she could just like stand there. She didn't have to move anymore. And then she would start, she would just start gazing off. And so I told my husband, I said, she's having one. Let's go. Let's get her. So I picked her up. And as we were walking, she was, she was already pretty big. She was a good 60, 65 pounds. Mm -hmm. So my husband went ahead and got her and three weeks before when she had a similar episode, we were outside in the pool and my husband had put her over his shoulder to make sure that it would, he would apply some force to the stomach to make sure if there was any food content, it would come out. Okay. And so three weeks before I, when he had done that, I said, oh, that's a great job. That's, that's great thinking. Cause she did in fact vomit and we were able to catch it. And eventually she came to, but this time he tried it and nothing came out. And then all of a sudden, he just, he felt a, a big jolt on his chest. And that's when he stopped. And it was, it was kind of late at night already. It was about 1030 at night. And he just stopped and he asked me, he said, is she breathing? And I tried to look for chest rise and I, I couldn't see it. I couldn't see any chest rise. And so it's. We were, as we were trying to walk back to the hotel room, when we had stopped right there, the pool happened to be, the, the resort pool happened to be to, to the right of us. So my husband's first impression was, let's just quickly get in here. They had locked gates. All I remember was my husband was able to get in, but I wasn't. I was kind of freaking out, but I wasn't because I knew that we'd been through something like this before. But I needed to get through these locked gates. So I just remember, from what I was able to remember, I just remember crying out. Mm -hmm. Somebody, please help me. Please, please, this is my daughter. My daughter's in there. And so they opened, the, I was able to open the gate. And I see my husband just trying to clear contents from her mouth. And he said there was a lot of food impacted. Mm -hmm. Um. So then we just started screaming out to the lifeguards for help. And it, it's, it's such a big blur, but you know what it looks like when a, when a code's about to begin, just yeah. people start coming in from all directions. So all the lifeguards and they were, since she was by the pool, they had assumed that it would, could have possibly been a near drowning. Um, but we told them, we said, no, this, we're just coming from here. She's, she's having a seizure. And that was about it. Yeah, but she wasn't breathing. and mm -hmm. They did uh. the chest compressions and just what seemed, it probably was all, with, all within 20 minutes before an ambulance got there, which to me felt like seven hours. And I just remember them teaching us in medical school two hours with that. I mean, sorry, two minutes without oxygen to the brain. And we've already got some brain cells dying off. And I thought to myself, this is not good. This is not good. Yeah. And so they, they took her, it was, it was still August 3rd. It wasn't just quite exactly her birthday, yeah. but she, they did take her to the nearest emergency room and they ran, they must've ran the code for about another 45 minutes, probably about 30 minutes in, they were actually able to obtain normal sinus rhythm. Really? which I thought was very interesting, but it was right after I had prayed to God and asked him, God, please, please give me a sign. Just please give me a sign. 
of course the sign I wanted was for my daughter to be here with me on this side but little did I know could that have been God telling me she's okay she's okay she's with me Mm -hmm. and So she was then transferred over to the nearest pediatric where they could just give her better pediatric ICU care. So then they find, they do transfer her over to the pediatric ICU and they've got her maxed out on all of the pressors. Her blood pressure was still tanking. It was dropping. She's on the maximum settings on the ventilator They've even got the EEG running and it was her birthday. It had finally passed midnight. And I just remember the ICU doc asking me if I wanted to to go on rounds. And I thought to myself, I I don't want to do this, but I, I, I need to know. I'll never forget when they told me that there was no brain activity. There was no brain activity. And I thought to myself, I, my little girl will not have a life if I try to keep her alive much longer. Right. Right. So they were able to get her blood pressure up a little bit and then it dropped. And then it, and that just went on and dragged on for probably another three to four hours. Yeah. Until the ICU doctor looked at me and said, Mom, what do you want us to do? Oh, Marcy, it's the hardest decision I've ever had to make in my life. Yeah. But I had to call it. My little girl wasn't there anymore. Yeah. My husband couldn't make the call. He left it in my hands. He made his his peace with God. And accepted it for what it was. But he was so torn. My husband's a stay-at-home father. So he was just, oh, the look in his eyes. They were so gone. Like his soul had just been taken from him. I said, all right, Monica, you've been through you've been dealt some pretty crappy cards in life because type one diabetes at seven years of age is not fun. So with all that, you're here for a reason. You're here Mm -hmm. to make this call so your daughter doesn't have to suffer. So I made it. I made it. And I think about you being a doctor and they treat us differently, don't they? I mean, they, they treated you differently than they would have. I imagine, I mean, I've been in pediatrics. I feel like you would not have said, Mom, do you want to come on rounds with us? In that same type of way that they did with you. <laughs> and, and then it ends up putting so much pressure because... They feel like you should be the one to make the decision. <laughs> it does. It does. Yeah. I, d- I don't like the way people do that. I always feel like I, I always, whenever I talk to a physician family, I always make a point to talk about them, talk to them exactly the same way that I do everybody else. And if they want me to, to change, that's okay. But I feel like it's better than to have these expectations that, well, you should know more and you should somehow make this decision. And this, you're not a pediatric ICU doctor. No. Right? That's not what you do. And to put those type of things on you is a lot, is a lot to do. I mean, I, I appreciate the, the reasoning behind it, but it's a lot to put on you. Oh, it, it, it. <laughs> It was, but I know if anyone was going to make that call, it was going to have to be me. Yeah. And as, like you said, as much of a, of a spitfire as Zoe was, and as young as she was, I couldn't, I wouldn't put her through that because I know her quality of life just, 
she could have been dependent on machines for the rest of her life. I couldn't, I wouldn't be able to live to see that. And it's, if there was a fighting chance and we waited, we wait, I, I feel like we waited about a good 10, 11 hours from when she arrived in the ER to when they, they called the code. So I felt like I waited long enough and I put her through enough. Yeah, you gave her every chance you could have, that's for sure. I was afraid and worried about the guilt, right? We know that guilt happens with, yeah. especially even worse so being a physician. What yeah. could I have done? What could I have? Why did this have to happen? I should have known my pediatric advanced life support, <laughs> which as an endocrinologist, I don't remember, but I am. Um, no. I thought about everything through and through and everything that should have been done was done. Mm -hmm. And just, I've never known somebody who, or knew of someone who knew somebody that passed away on their birthday. So for me, it was just, it was like, wow, it, it was meant to be it. She made a full circle. Yeah. We talked earlier about that pressure that you put on yourself as as a mom I think all moms do that is you feel like well it's my job to take care of my kids it's my job to raise my kids and keep them safe and healthy and when you're a doctor mom you feel that doubly I think there's no question because you feel like well it's my job to keep my kids safe but I have all of this extra training that I've done that I really can keep my kids safe and healthy I can do it even better than other people so when you can't I think it's especially crushing for us I I it's just how I feel I just feel like it's doubly because now it's I feel like okay I was kind of a crappy mom that I couldn't save my son or your daughter and I guess I'm a crappy doctor because I couldn't save him either and so it it hits you from two totally different sides I know we talked about that earlier I want to just get your feedback on that and I I did initially feel a lot of guilt and just oh my goodness how how am I going to be able to care for people yeah if I couldn't even care for my own daughter yeah and I know it doesn't, and it doesn't make sense, right? Everyone, anyone listening to this is going to say, well, that doesn't make any sense. But it's how you end up feeling, even though it's totally irrational, right? There was nothing that you could have done. There was nothing that I could have done. But the irrational you just has those, has those thoughts like, I should have been able, I should have, I should have, I should have. Mm-hmm. One of the first things that I thought to myself when we drove home the following day, having to plan funeral services is, please tell me that this gets better. I was in such a state of shock, mm-hmm. but it was so hard coming home to the way you left the house, your nice. your kids' toothbrushes all over the place, their pajamas tossed over the tub, their dirty clothes in the laundry. Oh, Marcy, it was just, you just hit a brick wall. And I thought to myself, oh my goodness, I need to see if I can reach out to other moms who have gone through something like this. Yeah. But even more so, I needed to find out how the doctor mom did it. Yeah. Because I just felt like my whole world, my family, my my career, just everything was, I was waving by to it. Yeah. Absolutely. A hundred percent. hundred percent. How am I going to get through something so traumatic? I, they, they say out of all, out of all deaths, the hardest one and the most traumatic one is the loss of a child. Mm-hmm. And we know this. We, yeah. So I, I just thought to myself, okay, you need to, reach out, get the help that you need, get started, you know, in the groups and and get the word spread out. The word just happened to spread out much faster than I probably would have wanted it to. But looking back, I'm actually quite thankful 
because a lot of the doctor moms here in in our area, they put together a food train and they would call and text every single day. And just, it was such an amazing support system that I never even thought I, or knew that I had. Right. But they were there and I, I knew I needed to get that looked out for my, my, (laughs) my probably new onset PTSD, but then also watch out for my other daughter and my husband and Mm -hmm. how, you know, I can't treat others until I'm okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because again, as Dr. Mom, you feel like it's my responsibility really to care for them. Yeah. As a mom and to look out and make sure, are they doing okay health-wise? Are there things that I'm missing, right? Are there, what should I be doing? And and it's just this extra level of pressure. Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that extra level is, is pretty, pretty thick. <laughs> the pressure is definitely pretty thick. Yeah. I, I felt even more guilt because we just kind of brushed off febrile seizures. I never knew a febrile seizure could potentially kill my child. We were always told, okay, as long as it happens with the fever, then that's fine. That's not going to be a problem. And so. And typically it's not right. And what could you have done differently? Had you known differently? Nothing. You know, and it's funny because I always ask myself the same thing. What would you have done differently? And um, I don't know, would I have taken her to see a neurologist or a cardiologist to to maybe perhaps, or would they have just said, okay, this is, we're probably jumping the shark a little bit here, probably overusing resources, but you can't help but think how could this have, have slipped? Mm -hmm. So I come to learn her autopsy came back as sudden unexplained death of childhood. Okay. And I had never heard that in any of my medical school training. I heard of SIDS. I knew of SIDS. We learned Mm -hmm. about SIDS and all the preventive things that we could do to try to avoid it. But I never heard of sudden unexplained death of childhood. Mm -hmm. So what I've come to learn about it is that sudden unexplained death in a child that's between the ages of one and 18 years of age and approximately 30 percent of of children had febrile seizures 30 percent of the children that passed so um, i i i'm in touch with the organization there's an organization and SUDC.org. So they've got a research study going on and they've, they've been able to extract some of the DNA from Zoe's autopsy findings. They, they couldn't gather much from it initially, especially from any of the tissue sampling or any of the blood products just because she was given so much blood products. But mm-hmm. from the little that they were able to acquire, she was able to, to meet the requirements to get in that study. So hopefully they could do a little bit more research. And I mean, I, I know not many people know of that. I certainly do. And I've certainly had different moms on whose children have died from that sudden unexplained death in childhood. But I do have to say, this is not something though, as me, as a general pediatrician is going to go and tell people that really exists. Because again, what could you do to prevent it? Nothing. I mean, maybe someday there will, maybe someday with this study that, that you're involved in that Zoe was able to contribute to in her own way will help us a little bit. But until that point, I don't want to tell an other already anxious mom, oh, by the way, your child could just die tomorrow. That, yeah. That's not a way that you want to live right. either. It's just, it's hard. Yeah. 
That's why even the kids that die from a sudden unexplained death of epilepsy, which I've talked to several of those too, most of those parents have told me that if they had been given the chance to know that this could have happened, would they have wanted to know? And almost everyone has said, in fact, I think all four have said, no, I wouldn't have wanted to know because I would have lived a life differently. I would have lived more in fear and I don't want to live in fear. I want to, I want to live how we live. But there's no good answer. There's no good answer. There is absolutely no good answer. What if we could only have one more day, right? Another. Right. If we could only have another 24 hours with them, mm -hmm. another hour with them. I know. What would I say? What would I do? Yeah. It's I and and I I wholeheartedly agree. At first, I was thinking, no, I think I would want to know because probably I would have gotten more you know time with her and more chances to kiss her and say how much i loved her or maybe i would have worked part-time right so i could have spent more time with her but at the end of the day no no i wouldn't have wanted to know yeah that but doom. that i think in general i talked to my counselor i've mentioned this on the show how my counselor has said the mom always wants to know mom always needs to know why why did this happen what exactly were those things like and and what just needing to know all the answers and it's so so difficult when you can't and when you don't right. um, to have to just kind of go on and go I really don't know why and and have to live with that acceptance of not knowing why or not knowing what happened Right. I mean, it even is to me, to an extent, not as much as it is with you, but my why is, you know, obviously we're like in an exit lane going to a baseball game. The woman that hit us was going to the same baseball game. So how she was going 60 mile an hour and not 20 mile in the, ex in the exit lane behind us, I have no idea. And that drives me crazy. That little bit of why and what the heck were you doing? And clearly you weren't paying attention. And what was going on? Were you arguing with someone? Were you this? Were you that? Were you... Me not knowing that answer will, you know, eat at me. Not as much now as it used to, but it used to eat at me horribly. And that was just that answer to what were you doing? Not the answer of what in the world happened. Yes. And you got the whole, what in the world happened? Yeah. And you want, as a medical scientist, you feel like you really should know, and they should know, and you personally should be able to understand exactly what happened because of your training. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just such a challenge. <laughs> The whole thing is a challenge. The whole thing is a challenge. There's just so much frustration, I think, with that. <laughs> yes, so, there is. So I'm going to change topics now to that topic of going back to work and being working as a doctor again and kind of how that was for you, how that's been for you. Because you're still, obviously, we're still not that far in. You're still what seven months in so what's what's happening along those lines for you um well we we had transitioned or we're starting to transition out of telephone visits uh -huh. because of the pandemic yeah. so when i i went back i the whole from when zoe passed to the funeral and me spending a little bit of time with my husband alone with my husband and my daughter, it might've been about two, two and a half weeks before I said, I, I need to try to get on my feet. Mm -hmm. I need to try to get on my feet. And boy, was it hard. Yeah. It was very, very hard. I had to do all televisits when I okay. first started. And even that was a little bit difficult because I, I would just cry. Yeah. I would just cry. All the patients' appointments who got who got canceled and then rescheduled until I came back, they they knew. Yeah. Many I love my patients. 
I really do love a lot of my my patients. And so when they found out, they just, many of them cried with me. Mm-hmm. Many of them cried with me. And many of them even told me their stories. Really? And any children that they might have have lost that, you know, you would never pick up in a 20 minute, 30 minute encounter mm-hmm. because you're, you're busy talking about the condition and whatnot. So it was actually many, many of them helped. Yeah. Many of them helped quite a bit. And because I already felt comfortable and, and I, I connect with a lot of my patients as a type and as a type one diabetic. And I, I know all the tricks and whatnot. You can't fool me. Yeah, I, <laughs> I know not. what you're doing. I know what you're doing in the background. I did it too. So we have a very strong bond. I'm back to full time now. I'm probably about 98% in office now. And it's, it's still a struggle. Yeah. It's like, waves at the beach one mom once told me she said you're gonna have you know you're you're gonna feel okay and eventually the days you're gonna get more and more days where you feel okay but then you're just gonna have that one fell swoop and you're just gonna lose it and then you'll work your way back up and you'll be okay and so I'm going through the waves right now (laughs) yeah and she's right that those just come I mean, a couple of weeks ago, I mean, most days I don't cry at work anymore. I mean, at the beginning, I've cried between every single patient. But I I don't usually, except two or three weeks ago, I cried every day. Every day at work, I cried. Something yeah. happened. Something triggered me. I just cried. Um, and that's okay. I think I think that's okay. I know it's okay. Because it doesn't have to be like that the next day, right? Just because I did today, maybe I will tomorrow, maybe I won't. It it gives you, you've got a little more hope, I think, going forward. And I think you had said you had some crying between every patient here recently, just some struggles with that too. Yes. Mm-hmm. I was speaking with a mom yesterday actually who's 25 years out oh my goodness i can't even see my i couldn't see myself 25 days out right 25 months out Mm -hmm. 25 years how long is it 25 years and she she told me the same thing that many others have told me one day at a time one day at a time just don't don't look ahead of that Mm -hmm. because you never know what can happen (laughs) And boy, isn't that the truth after your little one being taken suddenly from you? I wasn't prepared for that, right? It wasn't cancer or anything. I had no, I had no, No you know, if I would have known before and had a warning, would I have been in Disney? No way. Oh, that's such a sob story. (laughs) Right. But it's just one, one day at a time. And she's, she's right. Every day is different. Mm-hmm. Every day is different. Even for me now, I still have a hard time thinking of 25 years out because I'm three and a half. And you go 25. Ah, yeah, I think I'll pass. Right? You start <laughs> You start to think, go, I don't think I really want to live 25 years without Andy. We can just have a little bit of an earlier death. I think maybe 25 is a long time to go. Um, <laughs> right? Because you can't let yourself think about that. I think about going that long without. So it is, I think she's right that you do one day at a time, one week at a time. You know, you get to yes. think, okay, I'm going to try to make it to next Wednesday. Because for a while, so Andy died on a Wednesday. So I was living Wednesday to Wednesday for a, a long time. Because it's just like one more week. We're at eight weeks. We're at 13 weeks. We're at 17 weeks. It was that time. And then it got to the point where I wasn't counting in weeks anymore. It was, uh, Andy died on August 15th. So it was every 15th, you know, every month on the 15th, I counted one wow. more month. And now it's spread out a little more. I don't get upset every single month on the 15th, but 
tell you that week that I had was horrible. It was the week of February 15th, which was the half year mark again. And every year I'm like a mess that week of February 15th for some reason. That six month point, it gets you, you know, now I'm in the second half of that third year. I'm at three and a half years now. So I don't know if that's what does it to me or that it's February and it's dark and gloomy in Michigan or what it does. But every year I've noticed that that week in February, I'm kind of a mess. So it just starts, you start to look at it in a little bit longer increments, but they still can get to you. Those triggers still can get to you and bother you for sure. Oh, yeah. So I don't know if you've noticed that, some of those kind of things like that. This week, I was I was thinking to myself, because the, the kids are on spring break this mm-hmm. week. So I thought to myself, this would have been when we would have been planning for a trip, even if right. it was to a local theme park or just this, somewhere, anything, family time. Mm-hmm. And I I think that's, that could potentially be what's triggering me because I can't even think about like a, a real vacation. Right. You know, what would a vacation be like without Zoe? It's, it's just, it's not. And we love to travel. So the, those things are probably my biggest trigger right now. But then, you know, it's, it's odd because you, I feel like you come to a point where you say, well, the glass is half full. What is, what, what could have possibly benefited, you know, not benefited, but yeah. I, I need to start looking in the more positive light. And I said, well, I don't have to celebrate a birthday and a death day and go through yes. this awful. I honestly thought that the very first time you wrote me, I thought, okay, well, that, the only upside to that is there's only one really sucky day. <laughs> I've actually talked to one other mom that had that same thing, that they died on the birthday. So they only have one cruddy day. And I like, that's just extra <laughs> cruddy for sure. But at least it's just one day instead of multiple days. So good. See, you are looking on the bright side with that. You there's know, the always other... a bright side. Right. <laughs> well, there isn't always. <laughs> there isn't always. And I... Sometimes it's a pet peeve of mine when people want to put a bright side on things. But I think you can say that to yourself. It's different if you say it to yourself than when somebody else says it to you, I think. But yes, the other thing that you said before we started recording, I want you to say what somebody recently told you at work. She, one of the farm reps who's deeply religious and meditates all the time and whatnot, she just always has this zen about her. She told me that Zoe is not your past. Zoe is your future. And she was referring to her making up a spot and, and making up a room in God's mansion and preparing it for us for when we all come home. And there was something about that saying, there's always, like you called it a nugget. I love that word. It's a nugget that someone leaves with you. It's a mark. And it's just like, oh, it's so good. You got to jot it down. Because you know if you heard it and you recited it to yourself on that crappy day that you just can't seem to to, to get up out of bed and want to move nonetheless, you just repeat that nugget. And you say, okay. It's always my <laughs> you know what? I've, it's always my I've got this. She's my future. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember the first time someone said something similar to me is that instead of thinking every day I live is a day further from Andy, because you can think that, right? Now it's been three and a half years and his birthday's coming up again. And I can think every day is a day further from Andy, but every day for me is also a day closer to Andy. So when you start thinking about it that way, like I'm not getting further from him I mean, in some ways I am, but in other ways I'm getting closer to him. Of course, that brings me back to the 25-year thing that I'm really not a fan of. (laughs) That every day is a year closer, but I'm still 25 years away. Okay, not so great. But every day is a day closer. That it is. And that was the other nugget that I couldn't seem to remember because this last nugget that the farm rep told me about Zoe being my future, I was like, oh, okay, this is great. Yeah, but then that the previous one that I was trying to make my mantra: every yeah. day that you make is a one day closer to Zoe. 
you're absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Every day you make it through, you're one day closer. You're one day I closer. thought to myself, how can you get, how can you possibly celebrate another birthday? She's not here. She's, you know, it's yeah. those happy days. They're just, they're not going to be. And then someone flipped it and said, well, look at it this way. Every year that you're getting older is you getting closer and closer to her. Right. Because we all have our day, right? We don't know when our day is. I don't know when my last day will be. I don't know at all. But what I do know is that every day I live gets me one closer to that day. <laughs> and that day I'll be rejoined with Andy and whoever else, right? My mom, for sure. There you whoever go. Whoever else might pass before me. So yep. it, it it can be a joyous day. It's funny to think about it that way because I do think of death in a different way than I did before it's not as scary like in this abstract sense right it's not like in the, yes. in the I really want to die but in an abstract sense like well that day will be a, a day of being able to be reconciled with him yeah. now, I don't want it to be too soon because I'm not really ready to leave my husband and my other kids right now but uh, <laughs> But it I can would agree be with you. Way. Yes, right, right, right. I used to be so afraid of that, and now all I I can think of is, you know, it's not so scary after all, because you yeah. feel like half of you is there, because you still, I still feel like the umbilical cord is still there. Right. You know, like it, what is that book? Oh my goodness, I must have gotten like like ten of them um, <laughs> after Zoe passed. The Invisible String. Oh, I, I didn't get that one. I no, feel, I uh, oh, I got a ton of those. I feel like the <laughs> string is still connected. Okay, I'm going to look that one up now. My big one that I got is Lament for a Son. We got, I think, eight copies of the book Lament for a Son. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a great but book, it, but it is really funny to get eight copies of one book. Like, oh, another copy of Lament for a Son. We handed it, it out on a grief support group, and they really did appreciate it. So I think we have oh, two okay. left. So we gave away the other six, but... Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the invisible string. Okay. Got to keep that one in mind. I believe that's, that's, that's what it was called, but it's just the string connected by your family and by love that never, never disintegrates. And so I feel like that string is still connected. Yeah. That umbilical cord is still attached. I just can't physically touch it, see it, smell it. Cause that's by love. That's love that connects you. Right. And that can oh, yeah. That can't. Yes, be. no, never. So that's something that, you know, half of me is, is still there with her. But mm -hmm. then I'm, I'm here. I have to look out for my other one. <laughs> so I'm not ready to go yet. But if I had to, I probably wouldn't put up as much of a fight. <laughs> that's a good way of putting it. That you wouldn't put up quite <laughs> as much of a fight. <laughs> you wouldn't be arguing with God saying, really? Now? Yeah. There you go. Absolutely. Show me Zoe first, God. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Prove right. it to me. Yeah. Oh. Well, thank you so much for joining me today and sharing your sweet, spunky, spitfire Zoe. I feel like we got to know her a little bit. So I do appreciate that. And I appreciate your little nuggets that you gave us, that you shared, that others have shared with you, because I really think that will be helpful to lots of people. Marcy, and I appreciate everything you've done for us as a community. This is, I'm still trying to find my purpose and what I can do to honor my little Zoe. And when I do, I'll let you know. But this is, this is really, your program has helped so much. Oh. So well, thank you so much. But you know what I also appreciate is I appreciate you saying that you are still looking for something because I get emails from people <laughs> not infrequently saying, I don't know what to do. I haven't done anything. I haven't like, you know, people get foundations and organizations and do all of this stuff. You don't have to do any of that. You don't. You don't. You're right now. What you shared today if that's what you do, that's enough. That's mm. enough. You don't have to do anything big and huge and awesome. You offered those little bits of help. And right now, I think even being the doctor you can be and some of those conversations that you've been able to have with some of your patients 
has been pretty amazing too. So some sometimes they're just little things, just little ways that you have changed that you can affect one or two people in a positive way. And if that's what you do, and if that's how you share, then that can be enough. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thanks for listening. If you found this helpful or would like to support the podcast, please leave a five-star rating and comment. To help financially, you can text Andy's Mom to the number 53555 or visit the donate page on andysmom.com. Your donations are secure and tax deductible, and we are now able to accept Venmo, PayPal, and Apple Pay. Always Andy's Mom is a registered 501c3 organization and can receive donations through smile.amazon.com, Thrive in Financial, and Benevity, amongst others. Marcy loves hearing from listeners. Please feel free to reach out to her via email at marcy at andysmom.com. Also, be sure to sign up for the email list to receive weekly updates as well as pictures of all of Marcy's guests and their children. Together, let's work to inspire hope one day at a time.